Marcus Selman with Blakeville Fluid Control. Here, we're here today, we have a panel of, of industry leaders and uh, what we're trying to do is have a conversation today about how a municipality goes about securing equipment uh, for certain projects or, or a uh, certain part of their plant. I um, uh, have Larry Miller here, who's with the uh, La Virginis Water District. So Larry, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Larry Miller. I'm the water systems and uh, facilities manager for the water district. I've been at the water district about 10 years prior to that I worked for the city of Los Angeles for uh, 28 years. Las Virgins Municipal Water District serves uh, about 65,000 potable water customers. We get our water from the Metropolitan Water District, comes from all the way from Sacramento down through the Delta, gets pumped over the Tehachapi Mountains and winds up in our water district. Uh, because we're at the very western end of the uh, water pipe, Metropolitan's water pipe, in the summer months when the demand is high, the water demand for drinking water is high, we uh, have to have an additional supply. So if you look out here, you can see a 10,000 acre foot reservoir that's stored with uh, fresh water, potable water that we buy from Metropolitan. It's the same water that you get out of your tap. We put it in the, uh, in the lake, a reservoir, and then in the summer months or whenever Metropolitan Water District's having a large shutdown to work on their pipelines or what have you, their facilities go down, then we have an available source to use. Uh, and, and we do that in the, typically in the winter time when demand's low, that's when we start to plant up again to take care of this thing. So we, so we put the water in there, it sits there, and then we have uh, what we call in California the surface water treatment rule, which means we have to, in the old days we would just take the water out of the lake, put some chlorine in there and distribute it. Now we have to filter it according to the, to the law. So we have a filter plant here that we uh, have that uh, we filter the water and then we have to uh, disinfect the water again and in that process we use what we call chloramines which is we use sodium hypochlorite which is a fairly uh, dangerous solution and you got to be very careful with it especially for your eyes and your skin and then uh, aqueous ammonia which is another uh, agent and we have to mix those carefully with the water that's why uh, chemical our chemical injection system is so important to us we got to make sure we get it right and that it works and that it's safe. So that's kind of what we're doing here. We, we're taking the potable water, the drinking water, we're refiltering it, redisinfecting it, and putting it in the system for our customers. So, I so when you have a project that comes up, say uh, we we're just discussing an ammonia skid earlier, um, how does that start for you guys? Well, typically what happens is if we're going to get a skid, it's going to be on a larger project. So uh, what we do, uh, we're a small water agency, and uh, so we have a couple engineers, and our engineers are basically uh, project managers. So what we end up doing is hiring a firm uh, like AECOM. We're currently working on a project with AECOM, and uh, we'll we'll uh, describe the, the th we'll go out to bid, uh, do a uh, request for information, uh, send it out to a bunch of different engineering firms. We'll review their bids, and then we'll get somebody and uh, start working with AECOM them. AECOM will win. Typically, <laughs> typically <laughs> AECOM wins. We hope so. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, and then, and then we have a series of meetings, we have kickoff, we, we start out talking about the project, how we're doing, and then uh, once we figure out who, we, who we're going to get, sometimes we'll bring them back, interview them, uh, and then we'll pick typically the lowest, uh, the lowest price person, depending on what we're doing. Uh, not always, but uh, that's typically how it works. And then we'll uh, get together and have a meeting with, with, uh, with our staff, uh, the operations folks, the maintenance folks, uh, and our engineers. And, uh, uh, go over the project and how we're going to do that. And then we have a standard specification for uh, the stuff that we use. And then we give that to the uh, engineering firm. They, and they have a copy of that anyways. And then, and, and then on the specific uh, projects or specific pieces of equipment like the skid, um, typically operations maintenance, we have our preference. We have our, the machinery or the equipment that we know that works, that we like. And uh, so that, that's one of our goals is to get that equipment. We turn that over to uh, engineering, and uh, and then uh, and we do get the prints. We get all the drawings together and what it's supposed to look like, and we'll typically have those, that those particular project products or equals on our on our drawings. Then it goes out to uh, to bid, and uh, and, uh, and then we'll get a general contractor with uh, subcontractors, and then that's when uh, the uh, products start coming back together and that's where we wind up with uh, having RFIs, uh, requests for information from the contractors. Different contractors will bid, will bid different kinds of equipment obviously to save money on the project because we give, we'll give them like a lump sum. How do you get the, get the job done? And uh, so then it's up to them to, 
to get the equipment at the lowest cost for them, but still get us what we want. That's where uh, the uh, engineer comes in and our staff, you know, pushing on the engineers to uh, make sure we get what we want uh, in the plant. By, and we typically on, on large construction, it's all so in California, it's all low bid stuff. So it has to go through the public works uh, arena. So, so Ryan, from an engineering standpoint, uh, after this project has been instituted, I mean, what do you, what's your position? I mean, how do you go about, so introduce yourself and then tell us how you guys would get involved and where you connect the dots here. Okay, uh, Ryan Gallagher, uh, I'm an operations manager for AECOM in Camarillo. Uh, I'm also a civil engineer and uh, I've managed a few projects, done some design related to chemical systems. Um, so I do have some experience with that and I guess we just did, did a recent project uh, for Thousand Oaks, and I can think of some more recent ones in, in the area also. And it's been different, different approaches. Uh, some agencies are, have standards, and uh, they can make a case for why it needs to be essentially sole source, because otherwise they, are, uh, they do have to have an open bid process. Um, but I, think, I can think of clients that have just one type of pump. Others, some don't care, um, and they listen to us. We make suggestions, and we give our reasoning, and then we'll usually use that as our first named, and then have an or equal. Um, we've had some agencies uh, go out to bid like you described, but there's some that have gone and, and uh, been able to actually purchase it themselves. And I can, I'm sure you can think of City of Oxnard's one that's done that. Um, and then it would just be an owner furnished contractor installed and that way they get everything exactly how they want it. And I think there's a case to be made for that. Um, yeah, we, we've done that. We've done that on occasion. Yeah. There's been a lot of times where if you leave it open, uh, and you're not very specific, um, you can get a skid where it's just not constructed correctly and you've got valves in places that aren't easy to access and things. So um, I guess as the engineer, we make sure we're working with the operators in the design process that if they have specific requirements related to equipment that that's in the specs. Um, other than that, we usually have, uh, we usually just use our standard specs and what our engineers are comfortable with. And uh, as far as how they develop that, it's through, I guess, relationships and, you know, vendors are coming into our offices calling on us. Um, we have vendors that we like to work with because they're responsive uh, during the design process. Um, I can think of the most recent projects out to bid right now. We actually had a couple of, uh, uh, Crowley was one of them, provided us uh, a lot of feedback during the initial design period, provided us cost estimates. That was useful. Now, for, from, uh, for, from the user's end, use, end user standpoint, one of the things that's really important for us is to make sure that we get uh, equipment that, like equipment that we have now because we have typically have spare parts and uh, so for us to change change brands or change types now we got we have to specify so that from from our aspect that's one of our tough things is to explain that to the engineers and then that's that's kind of the pickle we wind up getting ourselves into is and we usually don't have a problem with it I mean we will come in unless we see a technical issue with what the client wants we don't have a problem with it um, they may want a certain type of pump and we'll peristaltic and we'll come in and explain why diaphragm is better for this chemical because they may not be familiar with they may be used to a peristaltic on this chemical but you know now we're using it for ammonia and this you know this application is better and, but other than that we usually just go with what you know the client likes something they like to work with you know their vendors that's easy to get the parts from them or whatever that is so um, usually that'll trump whatever we like to work with. I think sometimes it depends too on the, the specifications of the pump because certain pumps from different manufacturers will only meet certain requirements yeah because we've seen that a lot so uh so so from the engineering standpoint now now we have a project uh you guys have specified equipment uh drawings everything now it goes out to contracting or out to bid okay when you go out to bid then we start then that's when the contractor gets involved go ahead and introduce yourself uh jamie yeah, my name is Jamie Jones, and I'm with Spies Construction, uh, project manager and estimator. Um, yeah, when it comes out to bid, we, we take a look at the specs and the drawings, and we see what they've specified um, for their different manufacturers. And um, sometimes they'll say or equal, sometimes they won't. Uh, depends on where they go based on the discussion they just had. And then we bid it accordingly. And at bid time, we get scopes and quotes from different suppliers, and they're representing different manufacturers. And then we have to analyze those to see who has the <clears throat> correct product to meet the spec and is economically the best too because we are in the low bid process since it's a public works project. And so then what we do is we, we look at those basically and we bid the job the way we see it. If we're the low bidder, we get it. At that time, the supplier, say if we're working with Tim from Crowley, he, we get a submittal from him and we'll submit it to the engineer. And um, 
if we submit a, what they want, uh, what's listed, then normally it's just a pass through minus a couple little tweaks. Um, if you submit on the or equal, then they have to analyze it and see if it's going to meet what the end user wants. And uh, sometimes you can get in trouble doing that, sometimes you can't. But uh, it just depends on what they put in the spec, really. So, so after you guys, after the, after the uh, skid is built, do you guys do the installation of that skid? Or do you work with the, the, the operator actually work with like someone like Larry and, well, and installing that? We, we work with the plant or the entity where the equipment is being installed. We install the equipment. Uh, most of the time, if you're talking about a prepackaged skid, um, you know, they're going to have it packaged uh, a certain way. The skid's going to be welded together. Everything's going to be bolted down. It'll have a stanchion with a control panel on it or, or whatever kind of design it is. Um, currently, we're working on a project in Oxnard where we had skids that have to go down to the second and third level of a below ground pump station structure. And so the skids had to be designed a certain way because they had to fit through a certain size hatch. They had to be able to become apart so they could go down in pieces, be reassembled, and then put to, uh, all the piping connected. So it, it just depends on the situation and the project and the location of where the equipment is going to go and stay. Yeah, and typically we don't get involved with the uh, installation. Uh, you know, we, that, get, that gets us in between uh, what they're doing. Because they have to make it work, they have to perform. You know, and then finally they'll turn it over to us and you know, we'll sign it off and then we'll take it over, we'll take possession after the contractor installs it. We have to, gets it going. Yeah, we have to do like a, a startup period. So we'll do a, a startup and testing plan. Um, they'll have checklists on how we how we're to start up, how we're to check their equipment off, uh, make sure connections are uh, terminated, um, piping's uh, the right way, bump motors so they're turning the right way. Then we start up. Once we've started up and we have everything actually running, then we do like typically a seven day run period, a testing period, trial period if you will. And then, uh, then we hand it over. Sometimes and training. We, sometimes we'll write training in the spec if it's a complicated piece of equipment. Right. And typically that would go concurrently with the startup. You know, because when the rep, you know, Tim or an, another person like uh, themselves, they would come out, and so they'll do the training and the startup at the same time. That's very important. So Tim, now what I've learned here is from this standpoint is well, all of us we're really connected. Being a supplier to these guys, you're really connected with these guys to connect each one of these dots. Uh, can you talk about that relationship a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Tim Burschauer with Charles P. Crowley Company. We're, uh, we're a distributor for Blaco Fluid Controls and, uh, and a manufacturer's representative for a handful of, uh, of top line companies. Uh, so our job is uh, regional. We, we sell in the Southern California area to, uh, to the end users and to the engineers and contractors. And uh, like Marcus just started to say, for us, it's critical to have all three phases of that, of that sales cycle connected. And I don't know, we might even be the conduit between all you, you guys, you know. You know all, we're, we're for working together to try to accomplish something. And uh, our end goal, of course, is to sell equipment. Um, what, the way we see it is it all starts with who's, who's the end user? Who is the guy that has to hold this and own it and, and love it and tender, tender care it at the end of the day? And, that's the end user. And exactly what, what uh, Ryan's been saying is what we've seen. It's almost been a trend in the industry. I'd say 30, 40 years ago, the, uh, the engineering community held a much uh, stronger position uh, of conviction in what they wanted to specify. And they almost set the table for the end user. You will use this. This is what our experience tells us. Today, that table has turned. And, uh, and I've seen it happen during the, the course of my career where the end users are far more passionate about their equipment they want to have a say in it, and the engineers are much, much more frequently saying, yep, Larry wants this product, that's what I'm going to give him. I'm not going to give him lip, because he's my customer, and that's the way it has to be. So Larry will approach me, maybe, with a project in its conceptual phase. Hey, Tim, we got another project we want to take a look at. What do you think? We're, uh, we're, we're, we haven't assigned a contract or an engineer yet, um, blah, blah, blah. And, and depending on the complexity, maybe at that phase, he may decide to buy it direct. He may not involve a, an engineer. It may be as simple as just replacing a couple of pumps. Boom, it's simple. We do it directly. And he may have to still put out a formal RFP to several vendors like myself uh, because of this competitive bid process. So, you know, we've seen that happen. Actually, it's happening right now with Orange County Sound on a little project we're doing uh, for some peristaltic pumps. You know, they have a limit. 
maybe $5,000 is all they can spend before they go out to competitive bid, even for something as simple as a, a little widget. So, uh, so that may happen. And then when the complexity rises to a point where they really, it's beyond the in-house engineering capabilities, boom. Larry will approach somebody like Ryan or, or put out an RFP and go out for a, a professional services package, right? And, uh, and that's where we get involved. Larry might tell Ryan, hey, Ryan, we really like this particular product. These guys treat us well. They support us well. We want to stick with this. We want this to be the basis of our design. No, we can't sole source it. So, so that puts us in contact with now with AECOM. Ryan might call me up and say, Tim, I need a little help. We've got a project Larry might have told you about. And we start working with him, working on budgets, working on perhaps some even some professional uh, level of detail, uh, an NPSH calculation on the piping for him. You know, we double check us on this, make sure we don't have a bad, you know, a bad design going out. Keep those change orders down, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that becomes the situation. And then, and then finally, this, this thing gets launched to the bid like what we've been talking about. And that's where, where a guy like Jamie gets involved, job advertises publicly, and, and hopefully we're on top of it. You know, uh, we have a nice specification written. We are watching the bid advertisements for this thing to hit the street. We are talking to Larry. We're talking to Ryan. We're kind of keeping our finger on the pulse to try to watch it. Finally hits the street, meaning it's advertised, and the contractors start picking it up. And uh, at that point, if we're on our toes as a sales company, we're, we're, we're two steps ahead. We already know this thing's coming down the pipe, and we start preparing scope letters and getting a takeoff done and, a, and an estimate prepared for the, contra the contractors, the bidding community, and we get that out to them. Usually, if we're, like I said, if we're on our toes, right. maybe a couple days before the bid, maybe even, um, maybe even a week if we're really good, we'll get an advanced scope out. I think typically it's, it's a few days. Usually. Yeah, yeah, and that would be best case, yeah. Two, yeah. two I, days or the day before is generally yeah. about right. And it depends on the size of the job, too. Um, you know, if we've got a, you know, for a chemical pump system, that could be anywhere from a $20,000 to a $250,000 sale. You know, it could be a big, big one or it could be a little thing. Depending upon the complexity of that thing and how much detail there is, that affects how seriously we take that bid too. And, you know, in some cases, we'll actually go out with that scope letter in hand and visit the contractors, all of them, before the thing, ha before it bids and explain it to them. Because sometimes it is complicated. Like Jamie was saying, they have to do their due diligence and and investigate all these scope letters that they're getting from XYZ company and me, and they've got to make a determination at bid time which one actually meets the specification. Nobody told them, they just said, okay, I actually was named in the spec. Well, yeah, but do you meet it, you know? Well, I don't know. And he's got to become the judge and the jury as to whether or not something is going to be a problem for him. So we, we try to help by going out on a real complicated job and doing some education. It's pretty rare when we do that. But. Right. Yeah, but uh, of course, phone time is spent. Yeah, way you know, hopefully before the, the day of the bid, so that we can have some 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 good conversation. Yeah. You know, on the dead, on the bid day, it's hectic. Furs flying. Jamie can tell you. It's pretty wild. Yep. There's there's we're just one piece of this job. There's guys doing concrete, rebar, big pumps, little pumps. You know, uh, bar screens, centrifuges. He's dealing with stuff that might cost a million dollars and he's dealing with stuff that might cost thirty thousand dollars and the ones that's going to get his attention are the ones that are going to swing his bid so we we understand that and we understand what our place in life is in in terms of his focus on bid day so we've got to we've got to be cognizant of that yeah, it can be compl quite complicated sometimes you know because you'll have overlap right from one one scope you know one supplier saying hey we got these pumps this equipment uh this material then you get another supplier who's got half of theirs and half of their own which is included in another scope so then you're going okay well if i go with this guy so then we're making calls saying hey will you break apart your scope can i buy half of what you're offering if i don't want the other half and they'll most of the time say hey yeah take you do whatever you got to do because they're all intermingled and they're all quoting different equipment. And right. it, uh, yeah, it, it, it can get, be pretty complex. And then the prices will come in right at the end of bid time. You know, typically electricians wait till the last half hour to give you their numbers. Um, <laughs> and then uh, equipment suppliers are going to give you, the, they're going to give you a high number Absolutely. most of the time. So you got all these pumped up numbers. Then you got to be able to cut all your numbers and get your bid turned in on time within the last 
20 minutes. We talk about relationship too, and, and this is just exactly what Jamie was saying is critical to this relationship thing. We know as suppliers when we're bidding to contractors which ones are going to be maybe secretive if you know we have a friendship with this guy there are a lot of leaks in the industry there's a lot of leaks yeah <laughs> if I put out a price and 30 seconds later I find out my competition is cutting below my price somebody talked right yeah. if we have a relationship and we trust each other I know he's not going to talk he gets my best number early and I get out of his hair you know, and right, and that, and that makes yeah. it easier for us because right. I'm not having to go, hey, what's, you know, what's your real number? Right. You know, where are we really at here because I'm trying to get this right. thing turned in, you know? Because right. um, quite often it comes down to the last minute. But I still may call him maybe a half hour or 15 minutes before the bid opens and say, hey, Jamie, am I still good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> even, It'll even, though even though I've got like 2% margin on it, right? right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, and I'm, you're not, Tim. Somebody's below you. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets, yeah. It, it, yeah. Yep. it can be difficult. Yep. Well, Tim yep. brought up an interesting point, and I think that's the relationship part, especially with this type of uh, chemical equipment. It's really important, and it's got to be right. And uh, so a lot of times as a, as a end user, we may not have the uh, engineering expertise, technical knowledge to figure this thing out. So it's important to have somebody like Tim that we can go to and, uh, and you know, say, this is what we're doing. You know, and uh, he, might even, he might even give us a calculation. We, we want to put some chemical in water or whatever. It's got to meet these. It's got to be so many milligrams per liter when it comes out. What size pump do we need? So, uh, you know, now in the, day, in the modern day of the Internet, you, you don't really get that. So it's really important for us to have somebody that we can go to and talk to and that we trust and they can, when we're done, the finished product works and then, uh, that, you know, we don't have to worry about, geez, buying something and having to buy something else because it didn't work. So I think that's important in that relationship part. Yeah, I think, yeah, he did, yeah, I like how he put it, it's kind of a conduit that connects everybody because, you know, they've got to work the contractors because they sell it, but then in order to sell their equipment, they've got to work the engineers in the districts, right? So they've got to, because these guys aren't going to want their equipment unless they've seen it or know about it. These guys aren't going to put their equipment in the spec unless they know about it or they know their customer wants it. So they've really got to go all the way through the whole food chain. And, you know, and, and then it also depends on, I, don't, I won't say how good a job they do, it just depends on the relationship with whoever the engineer is because a lot of times you can sole source or even sometimes districts or uh, cities or, you know, whoever will pre-procure equipment and then they'll insert a number on the bid so you already know that they've bought that equipment from the name supplier. Right. That probably, I've, I've heard from a handful of contractors that they actually almost prefer that sometimes because it takes the guessing work out of the contractor's game and it ensures him that he's on a playing field. Well, I think, I think it gives the, the bidding, the, the general contractors that are bidding, it gives them a more even playing field because right. you end up with, you know, like, like we've lost jobs before where, you know, it was obvious to see that the, the low bidder went with somebody that was an or equal or not named. And maybe they lost money on the job or we know they lost money at the end of the job because, you know, the industry's small, a lot of people talk, but you just, you know, at the competitive bid time, no matter how good a relationship we have with the Las Virgin is, they can't just give us a job. That's true. It, they, they, they may want particular contractors, but if those contractors aren't low, then they've got to work with ABC Construction. It doesn't matter. It's just whoever the low bidder is. So it's a, it's a very delicate process. For us, because once, that, once, once it gets to that contractor level, it's really in, in the engineer's hands. And, uh, so, and, and we know contractors that we can work with. And uh, that, you know, because part of that, putting that equipment in is typically on a, on a plant that's online. So it, we have to make sure that it fits, goes in the right spot and all that. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, interfacing that goes on. So uh, that contractor uh, is a really important piece of the, of the puzzle. And, uh, uh, one, one question I have is just maybe we can take a couple of steps back. Sure. Right? Because we, like Blanco or, you know, probably as a, as a manufacturer, one of the things that we're trying to do is obviously help support the customer. So the question that we have is you've talked a lot about specs. Mm -hmm. Is we as a manufacturer wanting to make it easier for the engineering community to actually have the specifications? We talked about equal or better, right? And so I think one of the things that we're interested in knowing is Obviously, how can we, as a manufacturer, help you write specs? Is it through templates that we can provide uh, to our engineering community here? Uh, drawings, 3D modeling, calculations on our end. So we are actually in the process of preparing those. So one, how can we help you write specs? And two, once specs are actually written from an end user perspective or a contractor or distributor, 
uh, how easy are the, is it to get them changed? Yeah. And as an engineer, who's going to put his neck out on the line and say, I'm going to go with this new supplier? You know, as Blake was trying to grow into new opportunities, and we've been around for a long time, just the same for any other manufacturer that, uh, you know, nobody flies Pan Am anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? And you don't use a Kodak camera, right? Uh, where technology is moving ahead. And so as a company that's trying to stay ahead of the game, get written up in specs, and be part of the engineering community, and we're not part of that million dollar product, right? We're, the, we're, we're small, we're part of the overall picture, we make the system run better, but we're still a small piece. I'd be curious to know from your perspectives how that specification process, maybe you can expand on that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it probably varies company to company. I've been at a couple companies and I understand how other ones work. And I think the most effective way for any manufacturer to get into specs is to actually deal with the process engineer um, that does this all day long. Um, people sometimes come into our office, and, and a lot of times this is for most engineering companies, where you have design centers where there's a group of people that do certain types of things and one of those might be chemical systems. So you'd have this person that does chemical systems throughout even the country. And that's the kind of person that you'd want to get in with and talk to. Um, and what a lot of times happens is you can actually see our specs. I mean, they're interested in getting comments back. And we update specs for, you know, we may have a standard template, but we update them for every project. Um, because obviously things change and you know, specifics of the project. Um, but I think that's, we've had, uh, you know, so I don't do actual chemical systems in our office, so if you guys come in and talk to me, um, you know, I can listen to it and I can talk to the client at a high level, but to actually get to the specs, it's always better to talk to that actual process engineer. Um, so that's, I guess that would be a useful way to get in there and, and uh, do that. Well, actually for smaller products like what you're talking about, smaller components of a larger subsystem, the specification is really important for, the, for, for us as the end user because even just procuring items, uh, we have to typically go to the low, the low bid. So uh, it's really important for us to have a specification that we can say it has to meet the Blaco standard, for example. It has to you know, meet uh, so much you know, proof pressure or it has to, it, it, the materials have to be right so that we can get that because if we just get something go out to bid, give it to the buyer, the buyer doesn't know what's going on, there's no specification, we'll get back something that doesn't work. And uh, then we'll wind up you know, having to waste money on something that doesn't work. So that part of the specification for you guys, to me, is, is really important so that we can say it has to meet these specifications. I had a, a project one time I was working on and a, vent, and a vendor came in and said, I had specified a certain type of valve, control valve. They, came, they went to the buyer downtown and said, hey, he doesn't need that kind of a valve. So the buyer called me and said, this vendor says, hey, you don't need that valve. Well, it's my project. I'm the one who determines what I need. And uh, so we, I had to go downtown and meet with the, and it, finally I convinced the buyer that this guy was just trying to sell us something that wasn't going to work. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. But fortunately, the only thing that saved me was I had the specification from the product that I wanted. And, uh, you know, I set the CV value. I set what I wanted. And so I was able to get, and he was going to give me, then he said, well, I'll give you these better valves at this, lower price. So that's not how the bid system works. But the only thing that saved me was that specification. Without that specification, I would have been uh, having to work with some kind of product that my end, pro my end product wouldn't have been, wouldn't have worked. Right, so right. I think that's, that's for, from the end, end the user's point, that's important right. to us. I guess us. the product would have to have a unique feature though. Right. You've got to have, have a to be specifiable in the yeah. feature. Something that's that true. sets it apart. Because you can right. almost sole source without doing it by right. setting up the specs a certain way. Yeah, you put enough teeth, we call it teeth yeah. in that specification. So then when James, uh, James tries to, or Jamie tries to put something in, I can say, nope, nope, it doesn't have this. Uh, he says, it has everything else. I say, nope, doesn't have this. Yeah, we, I mean, we went through this on a, a project that has some chloramination stations, and we submitted on the, the chemical metering pumps, and uh, we submitted on equal, and they said no, because it didn't have the right, uh, right flow, and it didn't have the right... Uh, I don't know. Some silly little feature. It was, like yeah, there was, there was two things, and uh, they, didn't, they said, no, we want exactly what was specified. And it's like, well, you said or equal. Well, right. so a lot of times you've got to watch that. It's not really an or equal. So, you know, if from the bidder standpoint, it behooves you to just, just give the end user what they want at bid time. Well, sometimes, it's, like I said earlier, it's, it, it, maybe it's a training issue. Maybe it's a spare parts issue. Maybe the guys just don't know how to work on that equipment. We have a lot of, like, take a typical wastewater treatment plant or drinking water plant. We have a lot of different types of systems and equipment, and it's difficult for a larger staff to know how to, how to work on everything. So we'd like to try to 
stick with what we know. Maybe a lot of vendors give really good training once the guys understand how the equipment works. So we don't want to throw that that money down the down the drain. So that's that's another reason we're kind of, sometimes we we're, we're really sticky with right. what we want. And, you know, that's 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 usually what happens. It's because we have spare parts, we know how it works, we've been trained, and we and want and, and we have a lot of those equipment, so we can you know maintain that efficiency. What I'm hearing uh, from all of you, and it's very I hear it a lot. It's the word training, uh, and from a distributor standpoint, you know, you're hearing that thing and you're hearing the same thing. And as much as important it is to be a supplier. The training of the equipment is probably just as critical or more critical from a safety standpoint, operator standpoint. What, what does Crawley do to, to train these individuals or what programs do you guys set in place to tra help train the engineer, the operator, and the contractor on, your, on the products and the services you provide? We have a number of different ways that we go to the market uh, to, to do customer outreach and specifically in training. And, and training, like we all would agree, and, and particularly in this industry, is so critical because it's it's a technical sales field. We're selling technical equipment that has some very very uh, niche little pieces about it. You know, difficult uh, difficult applications. So understanding those things and, and educating our customer base about what those are is critical to us. We we see that as a as a huge benefit in the sales avenue for us. And uh, one of those ways is something that Larry's helped me with, and and I, I think it's. Uh, it's a symbiotic relationship. I help him, he helps me. Um, uh, there are trade organizations, um, CWEA, uh, California Wastewater Environment, Environment Association, uh, the AWWA, um, what's the one that we're doing coming up? Uh, Association of Water Agencies of Ventura County. We have a seminar where we get together with all the operators and, and then uh, have specific training. Right. And one of the things I just want to mention briefly or quickly is that when we do those kind of trainings with a large group of people, and different engineers and operators and maintenance guys, we always have to have the vendor keep the training somewhat generic because we can't really push a particular vendor. And that's where, that's where the guys that really know what they're doing, guys like Tim, when they talk about systems, they, 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 they can make it generic enough to where people understand and they get to see their product and, how, and understand how it works. But it's, it's, we're not saying you know you got to buy you know, clean brand X and brand It's more X. conceptual at that point. It's more yeah. conceptual. Yeah. So that, that's a really important feature too. For, and that, that's one of the things that uh, we like about Tim. We always invite Tim back because he knows what he's doing uh, and his, his training is generic. Because some of the guys might actually have something that's a different brand, but once they understand it, then they might say, geez, you know, it sounds like Tim knows what he's doing. I'll give Tim a call. Tim says, yeah, you know, that would work better if you used, you know, for example, like, you, you know, your accumulator, your damn or whatever and then that way that that's how those products I think get help sell, sell themselves we, we put in a large chemical system at the, one of the large wastewater treatment plants and uh, Tim was involved the engineers in the plant actually designed it we built it in-house I was in the instrument shop so we built the controls we put the thing in and it wasn't working right it was we were going through diaphragms on these on these large pumps like crazy Tim came down took a look at the system and said geez you guys need a back pressure valve on that system you're just killing. We were going through diaphragms like crazy, and uh, Tim told us what what to get. We put it on there. Problem went away. So during my career, since I saw that particular thing, uh, I would send the, my engineers, the guys that work for me, to to that exact training, so that they would design the system right up front. Because sometimes we do it ourselves. I mean, on a smaller job, we don't always call a large engineering firm. But um, so. Those classes are so important for the operation, the operator to know what's going on. You can troubleshoot it easier. Geez, oh yeah, I remember from the class that, you know, maybe that's what's for maybe the back pressure about. I'm, I'm replacing diaphragms I did three, you know, three in the last two months. Why, am I, why is that happening? Well, back pressure valve's bad. In the old days, the guys would never figure that out. They just keep changing the, the components. So those trainings are really important for the end user, for the operator, the maintenance guy, and, and also for the in-house engineers that help work on the system so it's been it's been a, a real help for us yeah we've we've kind of uh, we've kind of had a discussion earlier about that uh, how about how you know we're trying to take our the Blakely University uh, module of the website and add uh, components to help train better um, we have a distributor module we talked about the distributor module uh, with Tim a little bit uh, about a distributor being able to go through uh, Blakely training to understand the product better 
so they can discuss it better and obviously educate you guys better on the product. Um, we have an operational uh, module. It's going to be about maintenance and operation because one thing that we do, one thing that happens a lot to us is we we get a lot of calls and a lot of our a lot of our troubleshooting is done with you with an operator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wherever you guys will call us up and say, hey, you know, we have a, a damper that's not holding pressure or some, or some kind of other problem. Well, then that's our communication. And what we typically do in that situation is is we'll um, communicate that with with the distributor. So I, I will call Tim or, or someone at his, his company. And then, so we keep that, that chain connected together. Um, so that's what Blaco University is gonna be really about is, is being able to have a, a one-stop shop for, for information uh, on all aspects of pulsation dampening and surge control, those kind of, but also we're gonna be offering other technologies. Like we're gonna be offering information on pump technologies, uh, and information on uh, acceleration loss. We're gonna offer information on, um, different types of services just so you guys can go someplace to a web once well, come one click kind of to, and learn all this learn all this stuff and take that information and apply it to, to your everyday activities uh, one word i want to talk about real quick um because uh, it's very important i believe and, and i'll start with you larry is is the word safety i mean when you think when you safety is very important obviously to all of us because you know unsafe conditions can hurt somebody when you when you're looking at equipment and you're in how does safety fall into that Actually, that's the number one, the number one thing, especially in, in today's environment. In the old days, people would throw their manuals away. Only one guy would know what's going on. And if that guy left or whatever, you'd be left to just figure out how this thing works. And we're talking about chemical systems. So let's say you got an, a bladder or a, you know, a back pressure valve. Now that one side of that valve is full of chemicals. And uh, sometimes there's springs in there. There's, there's you know, maybe pressures from something else in there. So it's really important for the operations and maintenance guys to be able to go somewhere and how do I take this apart? You know, what do I have to be careful of? And uh, so I think that's, that's, that's really going to be, uh, really going to be helpful for, for us because, you know, you got to make sure you have the right people, you know, personal protective equipment that you know how the thing works and that, you know, you don't, let's say the thing's full, of, got springs in there and you hope to start taking the bolts off and whew, thing goes and now it shoots chemicals everywhere and maybe cut your finger or whatever. So, uh, that, that's really important for us, that, that training. Sa safety for you guys, I'm, obviously, has got to be very important. So <coughs> oh, yeah. uh, what, what is your guys' approach to safety as far as what, what's your thoughts on safety in, in your everyday and how important is it for, um, to have safe equipment? Uh, for us as a contractor, with having safe equipment, uh, you know, that starts with knowing what we're using. Um, <coughs> and we you know, basically, in order to do that, we, we rely on the manufacturers and the suppliers to tell us what we're getting. You know, I mean, we, we've been around the block a few times, so, you know, you have a pretty good idea, but if you're using a new product, you know, you need to know darn well what you're doing before you get into it, otherwise you can, you know, you, you may install it wrong, which could cause a bigger safety issue, or you could have issues while you're doing it. So, you know, obviously our number one concern is to be safe in the construction of the project. And then number two is in installing the materials, make sure they're installed in such a manner uh, to where we don't have um, an unsafe product that's sitting there you know, a, a good example is uh, uh, one of our jobs, we're installing a, uh, I forget, it's a, an instrumentation device into a, a PVC T, and if you over torque the threads, when the PVC goes from hot to cold, it can snap. And uh, we actually blew up a couple T's getting it right, then we had it right, and the superintendent and I were sitting in the office trailer going over some stuff on a conference call, and the thing was on the other side of the table, and you know, blew up. So, you know, you get, we, we figured out a way to make it, make it work better, but, you know, just, there's different things that you got to look at more than just, oh, once it's glued and put in place, oh, it's good. You know, like, like he was saying, you know, different things can happen different ways. So. Tim, uh, from a safety standpoint, you know, being a supplier, you know, that's got to be very important. The, the products that you provide for people, uh, how's, how do you, you know, think about safety? Well, it, you know, we, we take safety very seriously. And as a matter of fact, in our educational forums, safety is, is a key component. When we go out and do trainings in the field, the very first thing we talk about, the very first thing I personally talk about when I, when I do a, a startup training is the safety considerations of, of what we're dealing with. Not just the equipment, but, but the chemical itself. What are we dealing with? What are we stepping into? We're, we're going down into a chemical containment area that has sodium hydroxide in it. There's a tank, a 5,000 gallon tank of sodium hydroxide right there. And if it sprays you in the face, you're gonna go blind. So where's the eyewash? 
know where it is, figure it out by Braille because you might not have your eyes when you're trying to find your way to it. So that's the kind of stuff I talk about, but you know, safety is critical. You know, nobody wants to get hurt and we're dealing with stuff that'll kill you. So, so you got to be on your toes about it. And certainly, then we look at the product. If we're dealing with a product that fails continually and is spraying chemical on people, we're going to cut it from our line. We're just not going to put ourselves in that, in that environment. We're not going to put ourselves personally in that jeopardy, and we don't want to do it to our customers. They're our friends. We, we consider everybody we sell to our friends. They're, you know, they're customers, but we don't want to see, obviously, we don't want to see somebody that we've developed a relationship with and we sell on relationship injured any more than we want to see our family members injured. So it's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an important thing by all means. And, it, and it, I would say is one of the top decision-making uh, factors for us when we decide on what manufacturer we want to represent and take to the, to the market. Yeah, that's we get, we get all our information from the MSDS sheets that they provide. Yeah, that's, well, that's exciting about Blakely University. We're offering a, we're having a, we're having a maintenance operational section of video of tw like 12 to 13 videos on how to fix a dampener when it's, because it's like Larry's saying, when it, if something fails, he's dealing with nasty chemicals. And you know, that's what we always kind of preach is we want you to go home in you know, the same way you came in or, or better. You know? yeah. It could be as simple as making sure if, if you have to send it back for some reason, make sure the chemicals aren't in there because you guys, your shipping guy certainly doesn't want to open a thing up and have uh, some kind of chemical. So that's, that's an important thing a lot of guys don't think about. It. That, you know, that's an important lesson I learned years ago. I didn't even think about it. You know, we're sending something back that's not working more under warranty. Well, geez, if we have it on a chemical system, you've got to get all the chemicals out of it. You can't send it back to some poor shipping guy, and guy, unsuspecting person that, uh, you know, obviously, I'm sure that's part of your training, but yeah. I think it's a federal crime as well. <laughs> Probably a crime. Probably is. <laughs> 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 nice point. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah. uh, what we have today is a perfect example of how um, we work with all the different uh, agencies and, and organizations um, and people on the uh, from the engineering uh, to the end user, to the contractor, and most importantly through our distributor, uh, Charles Crawley, and how the distributor uh, connects all the dots here, um, uh, not only here at this particular plant, but across the United States and globally, and how important that is to, to maintain that relationship. Mm -hmm.